Dr. Clarence Lusane is with us. He is a professor of comparative and regional studies program at the School of International Service at American University, a commissioner for the District of Columbia a Commission on African American Affairs, the author of The Black History of the White House, the website American.edu. And Dr. Lusane, welcome to the program. Thank you. So pleased to have you with us. So uh, you were telling me just before we went on the air that your grandmother, was it, was in Selma? My grandmother was uh, one of the uh, organizers in uh, Alabama. Uh, she lived right outside of Birmingham in Bessemer uh, and had been active for many, many years. In fact, uh, she was one of less than 100 uh, African-Americans who registered, registered to vote uh, in her area out oh. of something like 20,000. Huh. Right. So she just she was a very brave individual. Uh, she worked on the 1963 children marches in protests that took place in Birmingham, uh, where King and the activists, about 4,000 children, school children, were arrested for demonstrating for civil rights. So she was active in that. Uh, and she knew and worked with the families of the people, the four girls who uh, died in the uh, church bombing uh, in Birmingham. And she was on the Pettus Bridge. Uh, she was on two of those marches. What was your take on the, on the movie Selma? Uh, I think it's a magnificent movie. Uh, it gives you what you don't see in Hollywood. When you think about civil rights as it's been portrayed, when you look at Mississippi burning, it's really about the FBI and yeah. their kind of arguments and basically putting, putting them in an ahistorical position of defending civil rights when, in fact, they actually didn't. Or you look at even like a movie like Lincoln, where the voices of African Americans are basically race. They're simply background. Right. What we get with Selma for the first time, really, in a Hollywood film is that the people who actually were in the front, who were actually on the ground, who were actually put their lives uh, out there to fight for civil rights, are for, are foreground. And you get to hear those voices. You get to hear the leaders, people like Diane Nash, for example, uh, other local leaders in Selma who, other than civil rights sort of historians, are generally are people who are not known. Right there, they're in the film, as well as just, just the, the thousands of unknown people uh, who decided that they would march on the bridge, they would march in the demonstrations, they would uh, put themselves on the line for voting rights and for civil rights. And so the film does that, I think, in, in ways that we normally don't see in, in Hollywood films. Yeah. The two things that were just very lightly touched on in the movie that I think are also very significant parts of, of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy are his advocacy for workers' rights, all exactly. workers, and, and even for his dismissal of the idea that there is such a thing as a menial job, that all work has dignity, and therefore all work should have reasonable pay associated with it, regardless of race or station or whatever, number one. And number two, his opposition to the Vietnam War. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I asked the question earlier of my audience, how do we work to fulfill Dr. King's legacy? Well, I think you you hit on a couple of important points. People forget that the 1963 March had 10 demands Half of those demands were about work, workers' rights. They were about uh, increasing minimum wage. They were about policies to prohibit discrimination in hiring. So the civil rights movement, uh, particularly as it emerged in the 1940s uh, from A. Philip Randolph, kind of all the way through the 1960s and 70s and forward, has always had a link in with broader kinds of issues. Uh, but, and again, as you point out, particularly workers' issues and the fact that it's not just opportunities that have to open up, but people have to have the conditions there so that they can take advantage of opportunities. And then the other thing that comes across in the movie is the way in which there's other radical voices that King has to deal with that are pushing him uh, to the left and pushing him to not just settle, uh, but that you really have to keep this challenge going. So the young folks from SNCC, for example, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, John Lewis, uh, and in the movie, Malcolm X shows up. Yeah. And it's, it, that's historically accurate. Malcolm X, literally uh, two weeks before he was assassinated, came to Selma, Alabama. He wanted to meet with Martin Luther King. King was in jail. So he met with Coretta Scott King, which you see in the movie. What they don't show in the movies, he also gave a talk to about 300 or so uh, local people, right, which was very uh, enthusiastically received. So the film is good as sort of kind of showing and I think what's relevant today is that there are a lot of issues that are linked together. And mm -hmm. when we look at issues like police uh, abuse, and we see what happened in Ferguson and what happened in New York and what happened in Ohio. Those are not separate from broader policy issues 
that have disempowered people so that these communities don't have the capacity to have the public policy in place where they can decide who's the police chief. Or if the police are abusive, that they can be dismissed and they can be fired. Which takes us back to the essence of the movie, which is if I can't vote, what can I, you know, how can I have any influence over anything? And, and you've got situations like in 2000 where Jeb Bush told Catherine Harris, you know, take, take a list of felons from Texas, run it against people in, in, uh, in Florida, and you're going to get disproportionately African-American names. And he, they knocked 80,000 African-Americans off the voting rolls in Florida just weeks before the election, which got Bush close enough that he could get the Supreme Court to steal the election for him. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. We're still doing it. In 1965. People died for voting rights. Literally. Right. People literally died. And here we are 50 years later, 50 years anniversary here in 2015. And in many ways, more insidious type of voting policy are in, in existence that have such devastating impact. One, for example, is felony disenfranchisement. Right. So in Florida, for example, 400,000 African-Americans cannot vote. Because they have a because felony. Because they have record. a felony on their record. And the laws in uh, Florida won't allow them, for the most part, to be able to get out of a position where they can actually vote. And that exists in state after state after state around the country. Some states, and part of the problem is that we've got 50, at least 50 different election systems yeah. because every state has its own uh, rules about how, it, how it's going to operate. Uh, that's one of the, I think, uh, w one of the goals we should be looking at now when we think about voting rights is that we move away from just leaving it to the states, which has historically been how it's been done, but that we actually need, like every other country on the planet, a uniform, fair national election system. Yeah. And I think that really has to be at the top of the agenda for voting rights activists, even as you're battling these immediate battles over voting restriction laws. Right, yeah. Uh, and then the, the, the whole... Uh, the, the continuing economic impact of discrimination on black families. The, uh, the last time I looked, and I, I've seen different numbers on these, but the proportions always seem about the same. Yeah. But a, a typical African-American family in the United States today has around $5,000 in assets. A typical white family in the United States today has around $80,000 yeah. in assets. Um, this is not an accident. This is a consequence of a very clear history. What right. do we do about it? Well, and the, the wealth gap has actually went up and down. Yeah. And so it's not uh, immutable. It can be impacted, but that requires intervention, public policy that very specifically targets addressing the issues of wealth, uh, yeah. the wealth gap, and the income gap. Uh, the same thing with unemployment gap. The records go back uh, comparing black and white differentials in terms of unemployment back to about 1963 or so. And from that period up to now, it essentially has averaged uh, doubling of white unemployment. That, even when white unemployment has went down and black unemployment, that doubling effect has still been there. So it really is going to require public policy and a concentration on the issues that prevent the kind of equity in employment and equity in, uh, in, in wealth and in income uh, that we see. And that just goes on and on and on. And isn't, no one's addressing. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and, and isn't to a large extent this uh, lack of equity in employment the the tip of a very large iceberg, most of which is underwater, which is like lack of equity in education, lack of edu equity in child care, lack of equity in, in housing. Can you stick around for a little bit? Yeah, I can. Let's continue the conversation. We're talking with Dr. Clarence Lusane, a uh, professor of comparative and regional studies uh, program at the School of International Service at American University and a commissioner of the D.C. Uh, the D.C. Commission on African American Affairs, author of The Black History of the White House. We'll do that. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And you can read about Dr. Lusain and his work over at uh, American.edu. And check out his book, The Black History of the White House. And welcome back. Dr. Lusain is still with us. And we were talking about the... the, the, the wealth gap in the, the racial wealth gap in this country. Um, what, are, what do you think are the, or, or no, I mean, what did you, you're a scholar of this stuff. I, you know, I'm just a commentator. Uh, 
what what is the basis of that? What what are the what are the main pressure points? What are the areas that we really need to be attending to right now to help resolve that? Okay, you, you're more than a commentator. <laughs> you actually have um, important insights, I think. Thank you. Uh, just even kind of raising these questions because you generally are not hearing these issues being raised. There is a very good paper that was put out by the Economic Policy Institute called The Making of Ferguson. And what that paper does, it traces the history and the evolution of the, of the uh, creation of Ferguson and the ways in which a long history of racial covenants, mm -hmm. of zoning laws that were biased, of policy, federal policy, state policy, uh, that had an impact in shaping what we now know as the very desperate situation uh, that people face in Ferguson, the economic situation, the social situation. So when we look around the country, we have to look at not just the attitudes of people. It's not just about prejudice. It really is about the policies that historically have existed that were explicitly racist, the policies that emerged that on their face were neutral, but had disproportionate racial impact, and then the policies uh, that further um, uh, economic power upward. Yeah. Uh, the things that you know, Thomas Pinckney and other people have written about, about the ways in which the well, we can, differential we, kind we of We can get very grows. personal and specific about this. I mean, the, the uh, mm -hmm. for example, i just tell you a little bit of my story. My dad worked in a tool and die shop for 40 years, which got right. my family into the middle class. But he was able to do that and to buy the house that he had back then unions were largely keeping African Americans out this was a union mm -hmm. shop my dad was white I mean you know that right. that was my principal inherit I got nothing from my from my family my right. father had you know no inheritance but 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 I got white skin from him I got white right. privilege from him so number one he was able to work in a union shop number two he came back from World War two and on the GI yeah, bill he was able to buy a house African Americans came back from World War two they couldn't buy houses because they were right. redlined Number three, he came back on the GI Bill. He went to college for a couple of years until my mom got pregnant with me and he dropped out. African Americans came back. Came back. They couldn't use they the GI Bill. There, there were schools that wouldn't take them. Right. I mean, it, it, do I have this right? I mean, this this is the basis yeah. of just a generation away of and, of this dis, dis, this disparity. And I grew up in Detroit, and when I came out of uh, high school uh, in the early seventies, I literally was able to walk to the factory and start working. Yeah. Literally within 24 hours, high paying job yeah. at that point, hard work, brutally hard work, but high paying job within 10 years, factories close. Yeah. So post industrialization societies uh, have had wretched impact uh, across this country disproportionately on those who most could afford not to be able to, uh, who could only get into the middle class through that kind of hard work. Yeah. They weren't getting through college attendance, you know, but they could get in, their children could go to college, right. right? That has gone. And we have abandoned large sectors of this country, disproportionately black, but disproportionately working people, yeah. right? So with, nobody's with, giving that attention, Democrat or Republican. Yeah, and I would yeah, and I would point to our insane trade policies as the principal villain there, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Stick around, we'll be right back uh, with Dr. Clarence Hussain. Taking back the mainstream media three hours a day, five days a week. Dr. Clarence Lussain with us, the author of The Black History of the White House, professor of comparative and regional studies program at, uh, at the, in the, is that, am I saying it right? In, in the, in, in the, in the of comparative and right? regional studies program at the School of International Service at American University. Um, you, you were saying about your dissertation? Yeah, my dissertation focused on the impact of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, on black employment in the United States. Oh. But the broader context, though, is we live in a global world now. Yeah. And one of the things I think we can learn from, from um, Martin Luther King was that he actually did think in global terms. And he's actually had kind of a global impact. And one of the things that I find frustrating has been uh, so much attention paid to his domestic politics that it's really kind of underplayed the degree to which both he thought in a, in a global context and which he had a global uh, impact. So, for example, 
uh, Tiananmen Square, the demonstrations that took place in China in 1989. The leaders of that demonstration, the youth leaders, very explicitly studied Martin Luther King before they went into uh, and went into action. Wow. If we look at the Occupy movement that just happened in Hong Kong this past fall, those leaders also explicitly struggled, I mean, uh, studied Martin Luther King. So I think our uh, our understanding of King has to broaden so that we see that he really was a profound thinker, not just on domestic politics, but in ways in which he was increasingly seen a global, we're all globally tied together. And yeah. then we, we, when we talk about these issues of employment and these issues of development, uh, they're not single issues affecting one single country or one community. They really are uh, globally linked. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, the, another piece that seems to be lost to history, or at least lost to mainstream history, is that in 68, the Poor, persons, the poor People's March, it was the first Occupy movement, six weeks on the mall. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Occupy, and then we're covering the Occupy movement here in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago, and nobody's saying, right. oh, this is the second time we've done this. Resurrection City. Yeah. Actually, actually, you could argue that the student sit-ins uh, that happened in beginning in 1960. Uh, right. But certainly, uh, the Occupy. Well, you can take it back we to think the bonus about, arm, arm The too. way we think about Occupy, you're absolutely right. The Resurrection, Resurrection City, uh, 1968, Martin Luther King's last campaign. Yeah. Right. Really was. We have to sit here until we get some transformation, until we get changed. Yeah, it's true. Where, looking forward, what do we do? Where do we go? What What can and and what can white people of good conscience do to have an impact on this as well as uh, as well as people of color? Well, I think there are a number of things. Uh, one is mass mobilization. There has to be a groundswell that brings pressure to policymakers, elected officials, that only comes from having people mobilized in hundreds of thousands, millions, right? Secondly, I think we really have to link up with people around the world who are engaging in many of these issues. People around the world are responding to Ferguson. They responded to uh, issues that happened in New York, and you see the you know there's hashtags, there's websites, you know. So there really are ways which we can link and make sure that there is um, we don't just have a narrow kind of perspective. Uh, then I think that people really have to look at issues of public. Uh, and political uh, involvement. Mm -hmm. And I think that means we have to not lock ourselves into Republican and Democrat kinds of uh, boxes, but really look at what are the issues that really have to be taken up in any political party. Anybody that seeks to represent our communities, our cities, our states have to be accountable. But how do you, how, how do you, that, that sounds nice, right. but the reality is uh, a couple of realities. Number one, in the last three elections, uh, in the House of Representatives, Democrats got 5 million more votes than Republicans. Uh, in the Senate, Democrats got 20 million more votes than Republicans, and yet Republicans right. control both bodies. In the House, because of gerrymandering, in the Senate, because right. of small states that have been targeted by these white racist messages that started with, you know, it didn't start with Ronald Reagan, but it really right. went on steroids when Reagan's first speech of his first campaign for president in 1980. His first speech coming out of that nominating convention was in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Mississippi. Yeah. I mean, about states' rights. And, exactly. and, and all the people in the exactly. South went, oh, yeah, yeah we he's understand, my guy. All we understand down. what that means. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, no, and it's I not even it, talked about by historians. Now. Well, one, I think the, the U.S. Senate is, 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 is useless uh, in, in, as an institution. It is one of the most undemocratic bodies of governments anywhere in the world today. Yeah. Uh, as you point out, you've got little tiny states like Wyoming with populations of 150,000 with more than that. I think it's uh, eight or 900,000. That still, has million. the same representation in the U.S. Senate as California. Right, with 30. I mean, it just does not make any sense at all. So, you know, there's major reforms uh, that are on the long-term agenda but need to be part of our discussion as we talk about democratic reform. Uh, so I think, you know, finding ways we can do that and how you reach into all of these pockets around the country, particularly with young people. You know, I find it very uh, 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 helpful to have discussions with high school students and mm -hmm. college students, yeah. right, because they really are coming into their own, and they're the citizens of the next, 
you know, for decades, right? So you really got to reach there and begin to have these discussions, have that engagement, um, and that becomes the foundation on which then you can build institutions, build organizations, build the kind of uh, vehicles that then become the means by which you try to get change. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it's so important that uh, if you're going to see the movie Selma, take some young people with you. Absolutely. You know, it's absolutely. like this, this, is, this, is, absolutely. this is a moment of history that is not well described. But is brilliant is described in this movie. Well, apparently, though, there was a, a stu school superintendent in Alabama who just banned students from going to see the movie. Seriously? Seriously. There was some complaint, supposedly, about the movie containing profanity. So, therefore, but, you know, it became an excuse for not engaging in Alabama, in Alabama history. But I wouldn't be surprised in a number of states you would see uh, that kind of movie. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's. It's Robert E. Lee Day in five states right now. That's right. bizarre. <laughs> that is bizarre. Dr. Clarence Lusane, author of The Black History of the White House, professor at American University, American.edu. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Great to have you.